Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Hi, and welcome to the next episode of Decoding AQ. I'm, I've got something very exciting for you all today. I have some uh, improv specialist background people in Ellen and Jenny from the Boulder Company. And one thing that I really loved about your strapline and Boulder Company was step up, speak up, and stay up. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Ross. Thanks. <laughs> and really, um, you join us and your area is quite interesting because a lot of people talk about behavioral change and transformation. And there was another key word and words really matter. And it's described as a catalyst for lasting behavioral change mm. that empowers businesses to thrive. And so tell me a little bit more about Boulder Company and your backgrounds. All right. Um, so Jenny and I have been friends for, I think it's 18 years at this point. We've been friends a very long time. And we started doing improv together for fun. We both owned our own companies. And uh, the improv exercises for us, uh, you know, I, I would say Jenny got it more quickly than I did, but we both started saying these exercises that we're learning are applicable in the work that we're doing in our professional lives. I was working as a full-time facilitator and I also had a marketing and PR company. I'll let Jenny talk about her background separately. Um, but what we noticed was when we incorporated not only the principles and practices of improv, but when we actually used improv exercises in the work we were doing, things shifted more quickly for people. So I'll toss it to you, Jenny. Yeah, I think that's 100% true. So uh, like Ellen said, we were doing our own things. I was largely working as an executive coach and doing a lot of learning and design uh, facilitation and freelance training. And so I was looking for something to bring learning to life a little bit more and stumbled into improv. I actually have a theater background from a million years ago. So it, reactivating it was like reactivating a <laughs> a part of myself that had gone dormant <laughs> and uh when that happened I started to integrate improvisation into learning right away and um what I think makes it work is the fact that we can read a book about listening but that's not the same as actually practicing listening and doing listening so improvisation puts us in a position where we're doing the thing that we know we are supposed to be doing, mm -hmm. right? If you're going to be a good conversation partner, it's a question of, oh yeah, I should be a good listener. But improv makes you practice it. So you form all these new brain neuro pathways. That's why I think it, it works so effectively and faster. I like that. And the aspect of learning and development through either coaching or facilitating it's one of these things where we go through phases I've seen within corporates of it being in vogue and this challenge. And one of the beauties of improv is it's fun. You know, it's a way to help people get out of themselves mm -hmm. and to break down a lot of barriers. And uh, I've, you know, in, initially my improv was watching it on TV. You know, whose line is it anyway? Mm -hmm. Going to Second City when I was at Chicago and I loved watching it. But it's a very different thing, as you said, when you actually do it. And I think that's true of a lot of things, and particularly around adaptability, is there's a difference learning to doing. And yeah. so what's been, and, you know, so improv's been a big impact that shaped your careers. What are some other key events uh, that you've come across that have helped shape your thinking and the way in which you engage with, with your clients? Well, when Jenny and I started our improv journey together, as, as we said, we, are, we both owned our own companies. And so one of the ways that we were filling our pipeline with future customers is we were going to networking events, right? Where people show up and they put on a name tag in the worst possible scenario. They make you stand up and introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your company in 30 seconds for, or less. So like no pressure there. But what yeah. we noticed was people were standing up and dying. They were the worst representation of their companies that they could possibly be because they were nervous. 
somebody had told them they had to memorize an elevator pitch and it was so inauthentic. And then you'd meet them in a conversation afterwards and go, oh, there you are. That person didn't stand up in this room. That person didn't represent your company. That person didn't represent you and who and how you are. So what improv does for people, and so when we started our first forays into doing work together, it was let's help people network more effectively because we can help them show up feeling more comfortable in their skin, which means that they, they're a better representation for themselves, their companies, and they're more at ease. And you know, so what improv does, you mentioned it before, Ross, is it helps us get over ourselves but it also helps us get comfortable with being seen and heard and seen and heard and screwing up because improv is nothing more than being willing to put yourself out there, make a terrible mess and keep going or succeed wildly and keep going. Cause it only happens once. It's not like theater where you rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and then you do it right. You rehearse the principles and practices of improv, but every scene is improvisational like getting up and a networking event. So that was really the genesis of where we started was how can we help people stand and be seen with more power and ease? And that's still what we're doing now. We're just doing it in bigger organizations with higher stakes for what they need to be more comfortable with. Yeah. And Jenny, I'm interested. So this challenge of being our authentic selves and how do we show up, you know, to be heard and the way in which we can feel comfortable. I mean, life is just one continual improvisation. You know, we set goals, we set plans. And then, you know, was it Mike Tyson? Every, everyone, you know, has a plan until they get hit in the face, you know. <laughs> and a, a lot of that is similar in terms of our lives and our careers and our past. We'll set a plan, then things happen. And so I'm, I'm interested in your view of how from this, you know, drama, improv into then high stakes, you know, executive coaching where there are real results. How is that really tied together between, oh, we've had a fun offsite day to this is having real business impact for us mm -hmm. and the human people that you work with. So tell me a little bit more about that. So I love that question. And one of the things that's exciting about that is that when you use improvisation to teach people what you're actually teaching them, and this is, this is how we designed, I don't know if every person who does the kind of work that we do does this, but many of our colleagues do, is you practice the skill or the principle in isolation. Kind of like if you go to the gym, you use a machine maybe that goes out like this. And in the use of that machine, you're only working your pecs, right? Or your pecs and your biceps only. Everything else on your body, you're not really using nearly as much. Your focus is on these muscles. So we design improvisation exercises in context to do that exact thing. So it lowers the stakes and isolates the skill so that then you're able to, as a learner, go in, practice just that one little skill, like reading other people's emotions, right? Because empathy is a thing that most of us need to get better at. So we might do an exercise where they're in character reading each other's emotions, but then they have a conversation, a rich conversation about, wow, where else do, do I need to be doing that in life? So they start practicing low stakes, easy access, isolated muscle, then they're able to practice it. We always love telling people, practice all of these things at the grocery store. Practice everything at the grocery store. Because that's, the, that's a low stakes environment where you can still make that extra effort to read that cashier's face and ask her or him, so you look a little down today. Is everything okay? And then they'll answer back. Oh, I'm not down. I was just concentrating. Great. Now you know that you were practicing reading, but you got it wrong. What a wonderful thing to learn. So if you practice it everywhere you go, then when the stakes are higher and it's real world, you have that much more muscle memory for it. I love that. And it, it ties into one of the lasting impressions I got from uh, when I met Chris Voss. He's the ex um, FBI hostage negotiator. And he wrote the book, Never Split the Difference. And they talk about low stakes practice. Mm -hmm. 
you know so you build the skill and build the muscle in low stakes so that when it's high stakes you've got some you know as you say muscle memory uh, within that and do you see clients and executives actually make that leap and those connections between practicing the muscle and then executing it in the high stakes as well and do you get the opportunity to have uh you know really good feedback because as you talked about there got it wrong but they had feedback so that they could then you know readjust and reassess so i'm, I'm really curious in the way you've structured your programs at the boulder company and using it where you're practicing then then they go off and do it in high stakes how do you work in terms of getting that feedback loop so it can be continual for lasting behavioral change and thriving so tell me a little bit more about that ellen well one story is we got a call maybe about six weeks ago from a former client from when we first started doing our work together. One of the things that people said to us immediately after our first class, which was about public speaking and presentation skills is, do you have more? So we had a, we from, and we said, yes, right. And immediately created a four part series. And then another four part series, because people were, you know, they were, they were authors who needed to stand at a podium and talk about their books. They were people who worked in corporate America who had to make presentations standing up in front of a room full of people. And we have this one physicality exercise that we made up and it's like, close your eyes and imagine that you are the sheriff and you need to walk into you know, a corral full of gunslingers, right? And have them take on the physicality of being tall and strong and making direct eye contact and also having them practice kind of slumping in their seat and not looking directly at the camera. And so we had them say, I'm the sheriff and this is my town. So this guy who contacted us said, first of all, we want you to work with our team because people really need to up their assertiveness and their willingness and ability to speak up great. He said, I need you to know that, and this is, you know, what, six years ago, that when I have a high stakes meeting, I, I breathe before the session and say, I'm the sheriff and this is my town. So that's pretty awesome feedback. <laughs> um, and then to answer on a more like how we do it as a company after each session, we're asking people, give us direct feedback, what worked for you, what's still challenging, what do you need to work on going forward? And we're also incorporating the improvisational mandate to make your partners look great. So if I go into a meeting and I risk speaking up and we're working with the whole team and they know their job is to make their partners look good, their job within that conversation is to find ways to yes and what their partner is saying. Yeah right? And, and provide them with support, nod at them, make eye contact, smile at them, and like support their courageous decision. So it's, it's both, it's behavioral in terms of how we act with each other and behavioral in terms of how I act on my own as I'm taking on what I do. So this challenge of taking th something that was theory into practice, into then trialing it in the high stakes to then becoming a habit, and becoming something that sustains as a ritual, as a practice, as a mantra, as you talked about, you know, before big meetings, you stand a certain way, you breathe a certain way, and you have a saying that comes out. And I think this, this vision and challenge for organizations and any people going through change is that we need some things that are stable, that do give us anchors, so that when we face uncertainty, we've got an element in that crazy environment and world that we can depend on, um, whether that is the saying that we have or the way in which we control, um, as I say, our breathing and things. In terms of some of the clients, and it doesn't need to be, you know, the specific stories of clients and bits there, but one of the things I'm really keen, and I know a lot of our listeners are, is leaders who are leading other people, they have teams, about how do they manage themselves and their own vulnerability and emotions and where you said, hey, got it wrong, got it wrong at the grocery store, you know, didn't do this right. And the perception of leaders or managers getting things right and the shift to being comfortable with getting certain things wrong. What advice or, um, you know, organizations or teams who do that very well to create a safe space, perhaps just give some tips or advice to uh, leaders who might be in that situation of feeling 
I used to have all the answers. I used to know the playbook. I used to know what was coming. Now everything's shifted and changed. I'm working in a different environment and I'm feeling vulnerable. Uh, how do they you know, feel like the sheriff when they don't feel like the sheriff is kind of what I'm getting to. So I'm interested, Jenny, for any tips or hints or stories around where you've seen that transition that we might be able to learn from. Mm, that's a great question. Um, I think that my top tip for an executive facing a, a sea of unknowns is to ask themselves the, the question, what, how do I want my people to show up? Do I want my people to show up thinking they have to have all the answers or behaving as if they need to be right all the time? Or uh, you know, do I want them to be you know, on the defensive all the time? And if the answer to those questions is, heck no, I don't want my people to be showing up like that, then it's incumbent upon me as the leader to model the opposite of that. Because if we know that the future, right, if we look at your research and your body of work, Ross, we know that the future is full of loads and loads and loads of unknowns. So getting comfortable walking through that unknown means modeling that and saying, okay, hey, everybody. And sometimes it's direct conversations. Direct conversations. We've had that many times with leaders where they had to come face to face in a coaching conversation and we've had to say, hey, you don't have an answer. And if you want your people to be comfortable with it, you need to start trying that on too. And once you give people permission to give themselves permission, that's the game changer, mm. right? We need to, need to give ourselves permission to not have the answers. So very often that's a step one right there is, am I giving myself permission and approval to not be the knowing of everything, not be the end all and, and be all. Mm -hmm. And that permission goes a long way. We don't tend to reckon with our own level of permission nearly enough. Yeah. And I think from that, Jenny, is a great point. And I love this conversation because it's all yes ands, right? You know, is <laughs> you take it, you accept it. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's what great conversations are about. And can we do that with ourselves? Can we have a great conversation with ourselves that is able to give us permission where we didn't have it before to change an identity of what was before that I was the person with the answers to? Maybe I'm not the person with the answers right now, but I'm interested in discovering them together and giving yourself permission to evolve into something new, I think is a really helpful. And, you know, it's just ticked a number of things in my own mind about how we operate as an organization of giving ourselves permission um, is, yeah, really, really interesting. And uh, yeah, I've got lots of thoughts now. I don't know if you want to add something there. Well, you just, you get, you just used one of my favorite words, Ross, which is evolve, right? Because so many times, that's another dimension that I never really thought about is how often are we having conversations about change and change is just every word. Evolve mm -hmm. is so much more approachable. Just from a language perspective, it's got a very different tone to it, right? I would like to evolve myself as a worker, as a, as a school bus driver, as a CEO, as a whatever, fill in the blank, right? You know, because there's something, there's something more for me on, on the other end of that, which is a completely different conversation than I need to change because this isn't working. One is a, an emotional load that is 10 tons. One is much more aspirational and inspirational. There's a whole lot more energy. I'd like to add a, a little bit on that because words really do matter. You know, they change our feeling, our sense, mm -hmm. you know, all of the nervous system of our reaction to, do we get this amygdala hijacking when we go into something that we're facing of this fear to, ah, is evolve, do we see that as something that's positive? Do we see that, that it is additive? Do we see change as conflict? Do we see change as bad? And all of these biases and associations that we have with words, with people, with jobs, with roles, all of it evolves. You know, we might have a particular word that means something in one country, in one culture, in one context, and it evolves over time. Mm -hmm. And this comes, and I'd like your thoughts on this, Ellen, is this challenge of unlearning. To accept something before 
and now give ourselves maybe the permission to see it as being something else later and particularly around maybe you know your journey from marketing and pr of keynotes of facilitation now into the work that you're doing of that evolution journey where did you have to let go what did you stop doing to give yourself permission of new things that you've now taken on wow interesting question um but my brain was in the 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 place of the clients that we intersect with and the evolution and shift that's occurring now simply because the folks who were raised by people who were World War II veterans um, who came from an industrial age and that industrial mindset that's still very operational in many parts of corporate America and municipal government and state government where we are, as generations rise, with different expectations for flexibility and vulnerability. And of course it, it varies by industry, but we see the shift occurring because people are more willing to say, we can be in charge instead of I'm in charge. Um, for me personally, from an unlearning standpoint, I've always had a passion for diversity and inclusion work, starting with my own, my own journey in terms of realizing it, I don't know, almost 30 years old that everything that I thought I knew about myself was really not very true because I was looking at it through a lens of having grown up in a mostly white suburban area. And so all of the things that were running in the background in terms of bias were things that I didn't necessarily think of. And once there was a spotlight on them, I said, ah, there's a place of unlearning for me. And how do I help other people unpack that? Right? Because the, the talk about loaded words, Telling people you're going to put them in a required opportunity for unconscious bias work sets up a wall of, I'm not biased. I'm a good person. My family are good people. I didn't learn that, right? So we have to disarm the whole conversation yeah. with different word choices, right? So the, the process we, we believe of unconscious bias and unpacking that is through the lens of emotional intelligence and who and what we respond to that does hijack our amygdala? And how do we notice the subtle things that take us out of being present, as well as the mega things? The mega things are a little more obvious, but what are the subtle things in our day-to-day -day journey? So the unlearning for me has been, how do I let go of things I used to do to focus more on the development of leaders? The answer is I don't let it go, I integrate it. Yeah. Right, Because we're also business owners. So everything that I learned in PR and marketing, we use. Everything I learned, most a lot of things I learned in urban planning, we use because we work in architecture, engineering, and construction. So, you know, the integrated piece of it is, you know, I'm not reviewing site plans for development anymore. And I can have that conversation with our clients about what they do with some level of understanding. So for me, it's more about like, how do we integrate? I would say the unlearning is what's, what are normal business hours? <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I really want to drill into this, uh, Jenny, where you picked up on evolve and to evolve things. So a, you know, a, a journey of unlearning that evolves. What do I focus on? What becomes a support act? What becomes a, you know, a, a stand in at certain points? And it also got me thinking when you were talking about um, diversity and inclusion and all of these pieces of how does I am the sheriff and that generation save for an individual mm -hmm. to thinking of the inclusive team. We are the sheriffs mm -hmm. and we come to this room and we come to this town. And I think there's always a place where it balances the zoom in, zoom out, the I, the we, where there are things where it is about you and it's mm -hmm. cool to be about you. Sure. And there's other bits where it's cool to be about we and inclusive and team. And that to me is, a sign of intelligence to do that with knowledge, with um, thought, with insight. And I, I wonder if you could tell me a little bit more about your company from the aspect of all these words matter and it's called Boulder. So, you know, where did you get that name? And is it from this sense of, you know, being bold? You know, what's the story behind the name? 
So the story behind the name is that when we had our previous brand, the first couple of years that we were in business, it was always a placeholder and we never completely loved it. And we realized along our journey, we worked with some good friends who were in branding and marketing and they helped us to get at, through their own facilitated process, they helped us to get at what is it really that we do? What is at the heart of our work? And what's at the heart of our work is we exist to help people feel powerful, whether it's an I or a we, because all of everywhere you go, what do you see? You see a loss of power. You see it in organizations of every shape and size where people feel like they don't have choice. They don't have authority or agency. They don't have uh, the ability to speak up because there may be repercussions. They don't speak up because they don't think they belong. They don't act because they think, oh, that's not the right move or I shouldn't do that. All these pieces that pull in emotional intelligence, that pull in assorted kinds of bias and uh, it pulls in that old school, what we would call an old school culture of the, you know, the industrial age Henry Ford is brain and that information workers especially need to be letting that go. We need to be setting aside that thinking because it doesn't work in the now. And because we're not automatons, we're not, hum we're, we're humans, we're not little robots. Yeah. So we can't say focus on creative work in the same measurement system or the same even way of thinking or mindset that we can think about how many of this widget am I making? Like the two don't work. So what that results in is people inside information environments or even modern factories feeling less powerful, right? When you look at all of these things in combination, it, it's a lowering of people at the individual and at team and that worker, leader, whatever level feeling like, well, I care about my own job, but I don't have a power. I don't have the power to do anything about the company as a whole or anything like that. So the Boulder company came from realizing that no matter who we're working with inside an organization, the challenge that we're putting in front of them is to become more powerful humans and to integrate more of a sense of personal power in life and in work. So we're challenging leaders every day. What's your power strategy? What's the strategy that you have afoot to help Everybody inside your organization feel powerful because that's a conversation. Not enough not, companies are not having that conversation. No, so we're not talking no. about let's make people feel empowered. We're saying no, let's get messy, let's get into the dirt, let's find out what would it take for people inside your group to really feel powerful, to see them be a bolder version of themselves, whatever that is. Right, bolder uh, for me, uh, elevation. Because I'm an extrovert, might be different than bolder for you as a more introverted person. Right, I'm saying you randomly as any person out in the world. <laughs> and I think so that, I'll get off my soapbox. I can do this all day. <laughs> I love it, and the the elevation to be more powerful, to have more powerful, and the enemy of powerless, mm -hmm. and you know, a lot of things comes back to childhood for me, you know, in terms of at what points has it shaped how I think, you mm -hmm. know, and certain things like to want something was seen as a bad thing to want something. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember my uh, coach for the last 10 years or so has helped me reform my relationship with wanting and seeing wanting as a positive thing, not mm -hmm. seeing it as a bad thing. Right. And similarly, you know, this challenge of everyone who hears something, hears it through their own brain and their own lens of life and power is, oh, is that a bad thing or is that a good thing? It, it's inert depending on where we deploy it. Mm -hmm. So I think the challenge of maybe some of the negatives about power is because it's been deployed in the wrong direction. Power being deployed in a great direction to thrive, to grow, to elevate others mm -hmm. is a really, you know, amazing thing to be part of. And I, I've got a really selfish question here um, because I want to know. And it's a challenge that uh, I see 
we're facing and many others are facing is in terms of how to communicate really well in a remote environment. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these things that I have gone through training in the past of having presence, of having body language, being a speaker, being a facilitator in a room, using pauses, using tone, you know, using movement, using anchoring of movement, using all sorts of different things. I feel so challenged to be able to read effectively through Zoom, to be able to get a sense, to allow people to have voices, to have my little court sense of the spidey sense of people in the corner that, ah, I need to invite them in. I find it so hard in mm. our Zoom environment. So I'm wondering if you can help me in terms of how can we be bolder? How can we be powerful in a Zoom world and in a world where people are working uh, in a more physically isolated space from our colleagues? Mm -hmm. So one of the things we have a luxury with Ross is that there are two of us. And when there are two of us facilitating in a room, one of us is talking and the other one is watching. So we're feeding each other information all the time on call on Lisa. She hasn't said anything in a while or, you know, Bill doesn't need to talk anymore. Right. So we are, we are doing some social engineering in the room when we're sending people to breakout rooms. Jenny loves doing this. She'll, she's behind the scenes. She's putting people in conversations with each other. If we know that we're working with a team that has some communication with people who need to talk to each other. So we're in, we're creating intentional dynamics within the room that very often you can't do in a room room. Yeah. Um, the other thing is Powerful. to acknowledge, you know, the more often you can put people in breakout rooms, the better off they are, because I think our brains just go numb, especially when you get to the tiled approach and you've got 20, 30 people on the call, our brains just go. Vroom. And it's also super disconcerting when somebody starts talking and you have to spend like the first 10 seconds of when they're talking, figuring out who in that maze of people on which page in this meeting it actually is. So we have to get, we have to slow down. I think we have to put less in our sessions, right? We have to give people idea more upfront about what's going to be covered and what their part might be. So we talk to people frequently about if you know somebody is reticent to speak in front of the group and you want them to contribute, notify them in advance that you'd like them to talk to give them some time to prepare and then make sure you include them, of course. Right. So part of it is just we have to get better hygiene around meeting dynamics in general to intentionally include people and also give ourselves a break from screens. Some of the best conversations I've had recently were conference calls where there was no video at all. Because mm -hmm. I think we're all a little over one, you know, everybody zoomed out. Zoom fatigue yeah. is the theme. <laughs> right. It, so it definitely is. Yeah, it definitely is. So a few tips there of you know, be well thought out and planned in advance. We should do that for all meetings, but maybe even more so when we are, you know, using these video tiles of people mm -hmm. to understand who we want to contribute, give them advanced warning. I love that great uh, piece and to use breakout rooms more um, yeah. so that we haven't got this cognitive overload of lots of people and faces and trying uh, to work with there. Jenny, mm -hmm. have you got some thoughts to share as well for us? Yeah, you're, you're making me think about something, Ross, which is I heard you say, um, you know, what can I do um, in these situations? And I would say it's actually, if I'm calling back to the conversation we had about leaders being more vulnerable or about any of us being more vulnerable and modeling more of what we want, even in a, say, a sales situation, right? Maybe you're interviewing somebody who you'd like to take as a client. You can use that as an, as an experimental space with yourself and with them to be more vulnerable by asking, so, you know, this video thing is just, sometimes it, it interrupts my ability to see what's going on for people. Here's the idea I just put in front of you. Can you tell me what you think about that? And that's part of that slowing down thing that Ellen is saying, that you can do that even in context of podcast recording or a sales conversation or a team meeting. Stop and ask, right? So an active practice that you can do is to hang up more of your assumptions at the door. 
right? Like just say, oh, nope, that's an assumption that's not necessarily helping me right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm just gonna literally sanity check it. So yeah. doubling down on inquiry is a best practice and it's a practice also of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. right? We use a little model, we call it maps. It's what's my mindset, what are my approaches, what are my practices and what are my skills? So you can take that on in any conversation that you go into as part of your preparation. I like that. And one of the challenges of everyone just losing the human side when we're just back to back Zooms, come in with task rabbits, get the next in bit done. OK, who's done that? Quick update to remind him we're human, to slow down, to allocate space, to maybe check in with some of those assumptions and, uh, you know, validate in that same bit that we talked about of a feedback loop. And so we can get mixed up in our own heads. Mm -hmm. you know, of our own thoughts of an event, a situation, a person. Don't be afraid to go and ask that in a, you know, humane way, in a comfortable way. And maybe it's even more possible when it's in breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. So we don't feel too much on judgment, too much that, ah, oh, what's everyone else thinking in here and pick our moments to do that. Mm -hmm. If we, because we're coming to the uh, end piece here and I've, there's two important things I want to uh, cover off one is if we all believe the fact that our world is accelerating quicker than it has before that in all aspects of globalization of technology of connectedness of you know access through internet for half the population over the next few years what's this going to do for our societies and our economy so if we if we're living in this digital landscape and this accelerated change, as people who work with teams and executive leaders, helping them to be bolder, to thrive in a sustainable way and create mm -hmm. lasting behavioral change or behavioral evolution, you know, in what they're doing. What are some tips again? And I really like making it as practical as possible. You've given some great things of your analogy of the maps, you know, what's your mindset, your approach. What was P remind us? Practices. Practices and skills. So are there any other little golden nuggets or bits that, you know, people who are feeling frazzled by mm -hmm. the pace of everything, they ascribe to what you've just said of slow down, ask more questions. Can you give them some tips about where and how to do that? Uh, perhaps Ellen, you could start us off. Well, one thing occurred to me as you were talking, Ross, which is be more discreet with how many meetings you have, period. We just finished up a huge project with a client and to a person, they said, we are WebExed to death. And most of the time when I get invited, I don't even know why I'm invited. So that's the first piece is be more discreet and intentional about who you invite. And the flip side of that is decline the meeting invitation if you don't know why you need to be there and set healthier boundaries around your own time. Let's I, just I know. pause on those two points a moment, Ellen. I, I, I've got to let that sink in for people. Be more discerning about your meetings and who you invite and be more proactive in, you know, saying no, if you don't know why you're there or what you're going to contribute. Mm -hmm. Two amazing things that will transform, I think, everybody's working life right now. Uh, yeah. Those things. Be in this more discerning in inviting and be more discerning in accepting meetings yeah. great sorry Ellen but I just wanted to let that okay. no, really good. hit home for people rather than oh, we're on to the next great bit that's really profound and valuable thank you and it and I'm sure Jenny will will echo this the boundary setting the if I have 12 to 1 blocked on my calendar every day for me to eat drink some water and get away from the screen then I'm sabotaging my own productivity and well-being by saying, okay, we can meet during that time, right? It's the only opening I have today. And sometimes that's urgent, but other times that's just a bad habit of blocking off time for yourself and then putting stuff there anyway. So that's the other thing is to, to protect the time that you've intentionally set for yourself for its intended purpose. Jenny, I'm gonna pose you a piece with a little segue. In one of my previous interviews last week, we were talking about how to say no and a graceful no and an elegant no. And I'd be fascinated as to, okay, if we're now saying no to who we would invite, 
and we're also then saying no to being invited based on being more discerning uh, about that. How do we gracefully and elegantly make that transition to evolve where that is a positive, not a negative? Uh, and we've got this bit of mess, you know, we're going to be in the mud and the earth of the, well, you've just excluded me. You always invited me to that, whether I turned up or should have been in. We've got that little bit of, you know, uh, mess to go through. So how might we really uh, say no elegantly and gracefully in that situation? I'd love your uh, insight. So saying no to being invited, is that Maybe an example? Both. Maybe okay, both or so, either, whichever one you want to pick. So if Ellen invites me to a meeting, I'm going to stop and I'm going to, you know, do what she said, but I'm going to stop and say, is this really important for me to be there? And if my immediate reaction is, oh, yes, I absolutely should be there, I'm going to ask myself the next question, which is, is that really necessary or is that just my ego yapping? Right? And that literally can become a practice of having a post-it note. Right? A post-it note just like this. Yeah. On your should computer I be screen. Here? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Should I be like, here? <laughs> yeah. Do I need to be here? Is it? Is it, it's like, it's that advertising campaign from the eighties. Is it real or is it Memorex, right? <laughs> is, is it true that I actually should be here or is it just that my ego wants me to be in the mix so that I feel like I have kind of a control? So there's that question always of, of what's the purpose of me being in the room, right? And that is something that you can take on as a practice with, you know, my favorite way to install a new habit is to put a post-it note on my computer a new mindset. That's what helps me reprogram myself every time is, do I need to be here? And then the other thing that helps me to get out of my own way that your listeners might also find valuable is if an Ellen and I have a practice like this in our company that we do with each other is I'm going to take that meeting. I know you've got other things. Do you really want to be there? And then we stop and sanity check each other in conversation. Mm -hmm. And we tell each other, no, I trust you to take care of that. Right? So incidentally, you're also adding a layer of relationship building trust when you mm -hmm. stop and ask someone, or again, there's that permission and approval piece coming in say, hey, Elle, I see you've got this, uh, this meeting on the on deck with uh, Magical Mike. Um, I don't think I really need to be there. And I'd love it if you could take care of that for me. I trust that you're going to just fill me in on whatever. I, I Right? So just I, opening up conversations would be, I guess, the, the, the heart of that practical tip would be just open up more conversations and sanity check your own ego. And I like the way in which we can think about the transition to the utopia. The mm -hmm. utopia where we're only invited into things that we absolutely should be there. We're really clear about what the expectations and how we need to show up. And likewise, we then won't have to decline things because of that failure in the in the kind of process. But there's this, as I said, the mess in the middle. And there's a couple of bits I want to pick up and then we'll close out. So the first one, one of the challenges in saying no, in doing that, what you didn't say was, well, just email them back or put it on Slack or Microsoft Teams and say, should I really be in here? It can cause a potential friction or thought of, mm -hmm. well, do they care? Are they not really there? And they go off in 100 miles an hour about, OK, have I upset you? Have I pissed you off? You know, what, what's happened here? To, ah, you took a moment in there and you, you used some great things of saying, hey, I'm not sure if I'm going to add much here. I, I, I believe in you. I trust you've got it. I'm here if you need me. Um, but it's probably best if, you know, I work on something else right now. That kind of bit for a little bit might soften the blow, but also mm -hmm. deepen the relationship. And uh, I had something else and it was inspired by your step up, speak up and stay up. And it was step out to step in. Mm -hmm. And so if we're thinking about in these meetings, if we're stepping out to then be able to step in with full presence. Mm -hmm that's a beautiful gift that people can start to reframe in their in their own minds so i'll let you do a quick response on that and then i'm going to ask you how can people get in touch with you if they really love what you're saying which i know they're going to and they want to work with you what's the best way to get in touch so any reflections on what i just said and then how do people get in touch with you yeah one quick reflection uh first of all it's a cultural 
thing. So let's take note of that. If you mm. if you operate in an excessively polite culture, people may be more hesitant to say no. And so it's it's a leadership thing, you know, to to ev- elevate it and say we notice that a ton of time is being taken in meetings. Let's all be more discerning. If you feel like you need to be in a meeting, you can ask to be included. If you feel left out, just know that person's probably valuing your time. So signposting and using clear communication about we're trying to shift our behaviors because everybody's burnt out. You know, you can't have meetings all day and still get your work done. So what that winds up doing is forcing people to do their work after hours or first thing in the morning, which means guess what? They're not paying attention to their lives and that's unsustainable. So the saying no to somebody else is saying yes to yourself. It's not actually saying no. It's saying, yes, my priorities matter. Um, and I guess I would leave it there. That it, you know, the communication around all of this, how we spend our time shifts because we can all be on all the time. And that's not healthy either. So, so it's the improv of the, yes, thank you for the invite or the exception. And I want to know, am I going to be as valuable as possible to be there? How can I do that? Those kind of things. Yeah. And I, I really, you know, this leadership responsibility to make no acceptable mm-hmm. um, and to give that permission and mandate for that to happen in what culture do we want to create? And it, um, lovely. Jenny, your final thoughts and how do we get in touch with you? What's the best way? So um, I think the... I love what you said about step out to step in and the idea of being able to create an opening for yourself to take ownership of your own experience in your, in your work and in your life. So that's, that's, that would be the, the, the piece that I like about step out. Cause if I step out and I take a respite, I can then step in from a much clearer place, a much more balanced, open rested even space by doing something as simple as taking a walk during lunch or remembering that we have phones and we don't have to be on video all the time. A friend of mine said that to me recently. He's like, we all sort of forgot that we have phones. So remember that we have phones because that allows you to step out and then step back in and be in that ebb and flow sort of space. People can reach us at theboldercompany.com. T-H-E-B-O-L-D-E-R company. So not Boulder, Colorado, but Boulder. Be a Boulder version of yourself. Theboldercompany.com. We're also on LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, and where else are we, Ellen? You do, you're do. you on the marketing team. I don't even know all our social media. I know our website. We're on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, and both uh, and LinkedIn, of course, both personally and, and as a company. So we're pretty easy to find as long as you don't put a U in the name of our company. I love that. And as someone who has, you know, got you in our community, I feel incredibly proud and privileged to have your thinking, your wisdom, and equally you sharing part of that mission with your audience you are regularly doing events, regularly speaking. So if any of our listeners want to go a bit deeper into the, some of these subjects and topics, you'll do yourself a favor and check them out at theboldercompany.com. And yeah. thank you both. I look forward you, to Ross. an amazing future of continual evolution that leaves no one behind. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have the level of adaptability to survive and thrive the rapid changes ahead? Has your resilience got more comeback than a yo-yo? Do you have the ability to unlearn in order to reskill, upskill and break through? Find out today and uncover your adaptability profile and score, your AQ. Visit aqai.io to gain your personalized report across 15 scientifically validated dimensions of adaptability. For a limited time, enter code PODCAST65 for a complimentary AQ Me assessment. AQ AI, transforming the way people, teams, and organizations navigate change. Thank you for listening to this episode of Decoding AQ. Please make sure you subscribe on your favorite podcast directory, and we'd love to hear your feedback. Please do leave a review and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.